Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Have I got sound? Have I got sound? Have I got sound now? Have I got sound now? Yes, I've got sound now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's Senate occasional lecture. Uh, we have a, we've had a bit of a dramatic star, start, but um, the lady who fell down the stairs is being looked after at the moment, and I, I'm confident that she'll be fine. Uh, but I'd like to welcome you, and in welcoming you, I'd like, of course, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people, and to pay respects to all Indigenous elders, past and present. Well, this time, 60 years ago, there was a great deal of turmoil in the federal parliament. And 60 years ago next month, the House of Representatives committed two people to prison for contempt of the House. We all know that the contempt power is a, is a, a very serious and significant power, and it is used lightly, you know, only in extreme circumstances. It's a, it's a power so great as requiring to be used with great caution. But this is the only occasion when a House of the Commonwealth Parliament has committed people to prison for contempt. And we thought it was time, given the developments in parliamentary privilege since then, that it, it would be very interesting to look back at that case from 1955, Fitzpatrick and Brown. And uh, to help us do that today, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Dr Andrew Moore, who has written a book about one of the central characters in the drama, uh, Ray Fitzpatrick, a book enticingly entitled Mr Big of Bankstown, The Scandalous Fitzpatrick and Brown Case. Andrew is an adjunct associate professor at the University of Western Sydney, where he taught Australian history for 30 years. And he's the author of numerous books, including the Mr Big and um, around 100 scholarly articles. He, he, his works have been shortlisted for prestigious prizes. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here today to take us back into the uh, intricacies and twists and turns of, of the Fitzpatrick and Brown story. So please welcome Dr. Andrew Brown. So, sorry, Dr. Andrew Moore, I'm getting my Browns mixed up. Thanks, Rosemary, for that introduction and thank you too for inviting me here. It's a great honour. Um, and I'd also, like Rosemary did, like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. I begin by remarking that it's been a big year for anniversaries, apart from what might be called the big one, that is the centenary of Anzac and of Gallipoli. Among them are the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, and the related events of 1945, the release of prisoners from German concentration camps, uh, Yalta and Potsdam, the Yalta and Potsdam conferences, all in 1945. It's also, I'm obliged to, uh, to point out, the centenary of the birth of Judith Wright, one of Australia's most famous poets, and indeed uh, there are ongoing events at the moment in Braidwood and at Tambourine Mountain to pay respects to her. Most relevant today in terms of the other anniversaries, other than Fitzpatrick and Brown, however, uh, is that it's the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, Magna Carta of 1215. And uh, there was a conference recently, and I know Rosemary was at it, uh, in Sydney, but at that conference, Nick Cowdery, the former director of the New South Wales DPP, argued that uh, from Magna Carta, uh, we take the rule of law, we take the separation of powers, we take the principles of democracy, we take the, uh, the uh, presumption of innocence, the onus of proof, we take trial by jury, we take access to justice, and much more. Well, relatedly, it is also 60 years since the privileged case of Fitzpatrick and Brown, uh, when 
many of those noble principles were cast aside. 60 years ago in 1955, the working class uh, southwestern Sydney suburb of Bankstown was the centre stage of Australian politics. Bankstown's local affairs were highlighted in a way never before and never since. They appeared in all the major newspapers around Australia and as well internationally in papers of the standard of the Manchester Guardian and the London Times. And the issue is a, a, a celebrated event um, in Australian history. It in, but it basically involves, of course, the jailing of, by Commonwealth Parliament, specifically the uh, House of Representatives, of two individuals. One was a local Bankstown businessman and newspaper proprietor, and his name was Ray Fitzpatrick. And the other was the journalist that he employed uh, on his newspaper. Fitzpatrick was the proprietor of a newspaper called the Bankstown Observer. And the journalist he employed, uh, his name was Frank Brown. I'll come to him in a second. Their crime was an arcane one. Uh, it was contempt of parliament. And that was a crime of which most Australians, and that included Fitzpatrick and Brown, and most members of the Fourth Estate itself, had not heard. So there was a great deal of amazement and consternation in response. This afternoon, I want to do three things. Uh, first, I think I need to describe the sequence of events. Uh, and I do that because they're generally not well remembered. But also, I think that understanding the background of the Fitzpatrick and Brown affair is the key to understanding it. Understanding events that lead up to the privilege case is the key to understanding the event itself. Second, I want to examine <coughs> the way events have been um, interpreted. And uh, here I propose to follow the parameters, the historiographical parameters, provided by two distinguished servants of parliament and of democracy, Frank Green, uh, clerk of the House of Representatives from 1937 to 1955, and Harry Evans, clerk of the Senate between 1988 and 2009. And finally, this time I want to conclude with some of the legacies that uh, relate to Fitzpatrick and Brown after 60 years. The Chinese have a saying that 60 years is a very important uh, time in terms of anniversaries because it marks the, the, the time of from birth to, to adulthood uh, and 60 years is, is in their sense very important. This is an image, as I'm moving on, of Fitzpatrick and Brown being led at the end of the case uh, off to jail, they're off to Canberra lockup initially. There was no uh, better jailing facility in Canberra at this stage. There was no certainly jailing facility in Parliament House. There now is, there's room for two in this Parliament House, but in 1955, there was no, no room for such uh, in people in, um, not for two people in Parliament House at that time. And they're being escorted uh, through the vestibule of Parliament House. I think the large gentleman in the front Ray Fitzpatrick has what might be called a nervous grin on his face. Don't think he's very happy at all. And interestingly, Frank Brown looks very confident and that's because this suited him marvellously. That's a long another story, but anyway. This is the beginning of the whole story, but not its background. And I'll come to the background in a second. Uh, it's the Bankstown Observer of the 28th of April, 1955. And as I say, the paper was owned by Ray Fitzpatrick when it attacked the local MP in Commonwealth Parliament, Charlie Morgan. And the suggestion was that uh, Charlie Morgan uh, had been involved in a series of, as you can see, immigration rackets. The information came from a leaked security service report. And that's a long story how it was possible for security service report to end up in the Bankstown Observer, but uh, we don't have time for that. The information, however, was an historical one. It actually related to events 30 years before, but Frank Brown had worked hard to put a contemporary gloss on it, um, and it related to a period when Charlie Morgan had worked as an immigration agent, doing rather good work, actually, as an immigration agent. But the way that the article was framed, it, was, it could easily be 
assumed to be a current matter, and that's certainly what uh, was felt at the time. So it was about 30, 20 years ago, but people thought it was about 1955. Now, at this point, of course, Charlie Morgan had a number of options, and one of them was of pursuing legal action for defamation. Instead, however, uh, he took a rather unusual course of action, and that was uh, he claimed that he had been intimidated, and the word intimidated becomes a sort of recurring motif in, in all of this. He had been prevented from doing his duties, from performing his duties as a Member of Parliament. The implication was that he was being bludgeoned into silence and uh, seen in that light, the matter was capable of being construed as an act of contempt of Parliament. The argument goes that if one parliamentarian uh, cannot do his or her job, that is to speak his or her mind freely and without fear or favour, then the whole role of Parliament is being subverted. First, Morgan was able to convince his colleagues in the House Privileges Committee that this was indeed an act of contempt of Parliament. Then, uh, after it had gone through the House Privileges Committee, it went to the uh, floor of the House of Representatives. And they also agreed, such that on the 10th of June, 1955, uh, the honourable members decided by a margin of 55 to 12 uh, in the case of Frank Brown and 55 to 11 in the case of Ray Fitzpatrick that yes, they would commit the banks down too. And the sentence was three months in jail. Much of the incarceration was served in Goulburn, which admittedly then is not the grisly high, high security potential it's become in more recent years, uh, but certainly the coldest jail in New South Wales and not the most pleasant place I would have thought to spend much of a very cold winter in 1955. Now when I tell this story people wait patiently for me to say something about the legal judicial process that was involved. They just assume that I might have forgotten it. Um, perhaps they assume I've forgotten to mention it. The fact is that this had nothing whatsoever to do with the courts and that's really what I'm on about I suppose. In this case, Parliament was the judge, the jury and the prosecutor. And while it's true that both the High Court of Australia and the Privy Council in London had something to say about the matter, they considered this issue, in the, the matter in dispute in those forums was not about the decision to commit two men to jail, but it was about the constitutionality of the process so there was a great deal of debate about, say, Section 49 of the Constitution, Australian Constitution, which states that, of course, that the powers and privileges held by the British Parliament are also held by the Commonwealth Parliament um, in 1901, that they're replicated in Australia. And of course, this had happened commonly, not, or not, un, not commonly, but often enough in Britain, therefore it was assumed it was quite okay to happen in Australia. And this, as I said, was the first case, the last case, the only case in Australian political history that, that, that this has ever happened. And it's an issue that relates to political history, it relates to legal history, it relates to constitutional history, and that's more or less self-evident. Some of the sort of strands of things that are perhaps a bit less uh, self-evident is that it also relates to labour history. Um, and I don't have time to go into this, but there's a sort of curious residue not of the split that's going on the Labor Party at the time with Bob Santa Maria and the groupers, but the curious residue of the split that Lang Labor caused in 1931. Jack, Pe Jack uh, um, Ray Fitzpatrick, when he appears in the literature at all, and I think there are only about two or three other references other than things that I've written, uh, he's often referred to as a Langite, and he was certainly a great supporter of Jack Lang. But the question I've always thought is, was Jack Lang in his period of Parliament 1946 to 49, a Langite himself, or was he indeed a committed Fitzpatrickite? Because Ray Fitzpatrick had the ability to get people to do his bidding in state parliament, Commonwealth parliament, and indeed uh, he had very a number of representatives in Commonwealth parliament who really worked for, for him. So it's to do with labour history, and the, and the thing that, that I'm just going to dwell on is the issue of local history. It is fundamentally to do with the local history, and it's the local history of Fitzpatrick and Brown that explains what is going on here. 
uh, understanding events in Bankstown, I think, are the key to understanding the privilege case. After World War II, uh, Bankstown was bursting at the seams. Factories were relocating from the uh, inner city and the population was increasing by 7,000 a year. Bankstown rejoiced in its uh, reputation as the Birmingham of Australia and it was also known as the Wild West and, quote, another Chicago, unquote. And how Bankstown acquired that reputation had a bit to do, a fair bit to do, a great lot to do, actually, with one of the central characters in the privilege case, and that's Ray Fitzpatrick. He was known locally enough, uh, known locally, predictably enough, as Mr Big of Bankstown. And that's a man on the left is Ray Fitzpatrick, looking very proud of his printing press of the Bankstown Observer. Ray Fitzpatrick was a 1950s style underbelly gangster, basically. Um, and to be fair, he didn't just rely on intimidation. He was uh, pretty much a case of the working class local who had made good. Uh, and there was general respect for him on those sorts of grounds. And he was also a very big employer in the area and he was not ungenerous to local charities. He was not uncharismatic, he was a bit of a larrikin. But the basis of his uh, growing business and property empire, the, the legitimate part of it anyway, was in construction, sand and gravel, trucks and dozers. It would take more than 50 minutes to describe some of the calumnies of Ray Fitzpatrick. Suffice it to say that he was congenitally corrupt especially if there was any issue of contracts with Bankstown Council. To be fair again, unless, un, unlike the gangsters of the 1960s, he did his dirty work himself and he mainly used fists. He, he didn't need shooters and goons. His brothers were fairly large too, but uh, he used his own fists to intimidate others in the area. He was his own enforcer. But if there was uh, a case of um, a lurk or a shortcut, uh, a councilman, a policeman, a politician or a public official to uh, even a judge, and there was one major judge that was very much a Fitzpatrickite, to be bribed, then Ray Fitzpatrick was the likely perpetrator. And leading up to this, what has been called the maelstrom of malevolence that Bankstown became in the lead up to the privilege case, there was a broad, broad fault line in the community between those who supported Ray Fitzpatrick the Fitzpatrickites and those who didn't, the anti-Fitzpatrickites. And the major anti-Fitzpatrickite, the major opponent um, in this instance as well as in others, uh, related uh, uh, more generally, was Charlie Morgan, uh, who was MHR for Reed in the 1940s at various stages and stayed there to the late 1950s. He had a very long career. While he was an uh, excellent local member and a, uh, excellent at bare-knuckle local scraps in Labor Party politics, he didn't cast a huge light on national politics. And indeed, if he hadn't had the, uh, re the Fitzpatrick and Brown privilege case, he probably would be totally forgotten. But initially, Fitzy and Morgan were mates. Their relationship was congenial until World War II when various constituents made Charlie Morgan aware of the rorts that Ray Fitzpatrick was engaging in in the construction of um, Bankstown Airport. His Fitzpatrick role in the building of Bankstown's airport was particularly inglorious. Again, one could talk for 50 minutes on the subject of the building of Bankstown Airport, but I won't. Uh, but to give one example, one of the things that Fitzy did was he uh, purloined an aircraft hangar that was initially intended to be built at Bankstown Airport and somehow it ended up uh, in his premises in Meredith Street, Bankstown, and he used that to uh, keep, his, uh, keep the rain off his trucks and dozers. Um, and this came to light. Charlie Morgan did a very good job of bringing these issues to light and named Fitzpatrick in Commonwealth Parliament as a war profiteer and as a general shonk, which naturally caused Ray Fitzpatrick to be outraged. And one of his responses was to organise Jack Lang to take the seat of Reed from 
Charlie Morgan, that is to get him out of the way. And that worked. Uh, between 1946 and 1949, Jack Lang was the member for Reid. And as I said, there is a moot question as to whether or not Ray Fitzpatrick was a Langite or Jack Lang was a Fitzpatrickite. I tend to think the latter. But apart from being, as, as Fitzy said, a good Labor man, he was a Langite. And as I said, Morgan was returned in 1940. However, Morgan returned in 1949. In 1949, Morgan and Fitzpatrick may well have uh, organised a truce in their relations, but it didn't last. Now, it was a long and complicated uh, path to Goulburn Jail, but suffice it to say that the turning point was the burning down of the Bankstown's other newspaper, the eponymous Bankstown Torch, owned by the uh, <laughs> redoubtable English family on the 11th of April 1955. Charlie Morgan fired up with the accusation that the Fitzpatricks had done it, and he did that firstly in Parliament, using parliamentary privilege, uh, and he accused them of, of uh, instituting a reign of terrorism and gangsterism in Bankstown, and then the national media began hyperventilating uh, about that. I mean, the Argus of Melbourne sent up a correspondent who reported on a daily basis as though he was speaking from present-day Beirut rather than, um, than Bankstown. Now, you can well imagine that uh, Ray Fitzpatrick was not very impressed by all this, all this publicity, and uh, he perhaps thought that there might be a case for using a tire lever against Charlie Morgan. He may well have contemplated it, actually. He was a big drinker, so he almost certainly contemplated it after a few whiskies, but he didn't do that. What he did do was to adopt a more responsible course of action, which was to engage the services of Frank Brown. Frank Brown uh, was a hard-bitten hard-drinking journalist, old-school journalist um, of a far right-wing persuasion uh, to write for the Bankstown Observer. They had a peculiar political arrangement. I mean, they hadn't said nothing in politics. They would, it was just for money. He was a mercenary from, the, in, from this point of view. And basically, Fitzy told Brown that he wanted to, quote, get stuck into Morgan. Frank Brown was best known for his uh, scandal sheet, which was called Things I Hear, uh, which regularly defamed parliamentarians on all sides of the House. Uh, and in short, he was a ratbag of the highest order. Indeed, uh, after he uh, left jail, he started Australia's first post-war right-wing nationalist Nazi party. Uh, indeed, he having been in jail, he, I mean, he came to the conclusion that he was kind of Adolf Hitler reborn and, and this was his role, his historic role, was to have a nationalist party established in 1955, which went down, of course, as these sorts of things usually do, like a lead balloon, and there wasn't a great deal of interest or support. So in uh, the 28th of April 1955, Frank Brown wrote uh, this article, the first one I showed you, uh, and it uh, referred to the immigration rackets uh, that Morgan had been involved with, and as I said, it's 1939, and the, the two three-month jail censors pursue, mm. ensue in, in, in that light. They are the result of that contempt of Parliament. So that's basically the story, but let me tell you now about how it's interpreted. I think it remains, the whole case remains po very poorly understood and remembered. Amnesia is a common malaise in Australia, and I guess it's partly because other events of the Cold War, the uh, split in the Labor Party, uh, the petrol of espionage drama seem uh, more attractive or more compelling. Most general histories of Australia pass it by. John Howard's recent account of his mentor, R.G. Menzies, uh, and Menzies' era is only the most recent book not to mention Fitzpatrick and Brown. And though there was um, a full-length monograph published on the privilege case, that is my own Mr. Bigger Bankstown, the scandalous Fitzpatrick and Brown um, affair, and I'm obliged to tell you that copies are available in the Parliament bookshop, uh, and, and this was widely reviewed. Uh, what it really needs is another underbelly-style television series about Fitzpatrick and Brown. It is an extraordinary story, and I haven't... I've, told, I've said something to you about the constitutional process and the political process, but behind it all, it's much more interesting than all of that. But for, most, for the most part, uh, the parameters of the debate about Fitzpatrick and Brown are still those articulated by Harry Evans, on the one hand, and Frank Green on the other. Harry Evans is indeed right. 
this was a case of contempt, uh, a little known aspect of parliamentary procedure that, uh, and a sanction that dates back uh, to the beginnings of representative government in Britain in 1689 and the Bill of Rights. Article 9 of the Bill of Rights uh, forms the basis of the principle of modern parliamentary privilege. Specifically, it declares that freedom of speech in Parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of Parliament. And such sentiments were reflected again in 1955 in the privilege case uh, of Fitzpatrick and Brown. Menzies argued in particular that the flower of Australian democracy, after the, they had been taken away, well, after the decision he made to commit the two to, to jail, Menzies made a very wonderful speech, very attractive speech, uh, that what had happened was the flower of Australian democracy and the degree to which this House preserves the freedom of members to speech, to, of speech will be the measure of its service to democracy. And those were indeed noble sentiments. The point is, however, was Menzies being sincere. Because for many years the received view of Fitzpatrick and Brown, and often repeated in newspaper articles uh, about and still to the present day repeated in newspaper articles, is that advanced by Frank Green as part of his 1969 memoirs. This uh, relied on, uh, th this was built on the advice that Green gave at the time that no uh, contempt, act of contempt had occurred, no infringement of privilege had taken place. But it must be said um, that, uh, that uh, Frank Green was no fan of Menzies and uh, that probably shaped his view of the privilege case. And it might also be said that he was very disillusioned with the parliamentary process and that also probably shaped his view of the privilege case. But for him anyway, Fitzpatrick and Brown was the bitter end. He'd uh, been in Parliament for 20, 30 years uh, and he would now saw Parliament as totally meaningless just a front, as he said, for the dead democracy. I said 30 years, I'd written down that he got 18 years, so that must be right. After 18 years of dedicated service, Green left Parliament uh, a week after the committal of Fitzpatrick and Brown. A valedictory dinner was held for him uh, and one of the entrees on the menu was Fitzpatrick fruit cocktail. Fourteen years later, Frank Green's anger had not gone away. It had not abated. In retirement in Tasmania, he contemplated the events of 1955 again when uh, making it clear in a um, book on the subject, or one of the chapters on the subject, that these disgraceful proceedings, he called them, progressed to their unfortunate conclusion without his approval and against his specific advice. Green explains that he was troubled by why no one took any notice of him until two or three journalists took it upon him to draw out a particular uh, event that had taken place. This was to the effect that uh, just a few weeks earlier, Frank Brown had published an article in Things I Hear, referring to that raw spot in Prime Minister Menzies' past, whereby in 1914, as an enthusiastic militarist and member of the Melbourne University Rivals, he had elected not to join the first AIF. Earl Page, of course, had used that against him in 1939, so Frank Brown joined a significant queue of critics imputing essentially that Menzies was a coward. So when Frank Green was confronted with this intelligence, uh, as he put it, uh, he saw the light. Menzies was after revenge, and that to him is what this was all about. In Green's view, Menzies and other politicians uh, including the then deputy leader of the opposition, Arthur Call, perhaps Arthur Call especially, actually, but were motivated by personal animus against Frank Brown. And seen in that light, uh, the primary target was Brown, such that, to use a modern term, Ray Fitzpatrick essentially was no more than collateral damage. They weren't after him, they were after Frank Brown. Harry Evans has a different version of events, a different interpretation. And he disputes Green's interpretation uh, with force and forensic precision. In a scholarly article that was published in 2003 and is included in his writings on the parliamentary website, Harry Evans characterised Green's account as unreliable and confused comment. Indeed, Harry Evans laments the fact that Green's account 
as he put it, has unfortunately achieved the status of gospel on the affair. According to Evans, Green had confused the issue of a breach of privilege with contempt of parliament. Evans is particularly disparaging of uh, Green's assessment that Prime Minister Menzies had been influenced by a desire to exact revenge against Frank Brown. And Harry Evans writes that that allegation uh, follows a long tradition of attributing the worst imaginable motives to Australian politicians. It might also be said that, that Harry Evans was less aggrieved about the civil liberties implications of the Fitzpatrick and Brown affair than Green, but he invites his readers to believe that this was a genuine uh, act of contempt, that the Privileges Committee clearly understood, correctly understood the ramifications of that charge, and the Parliament itself too correctly understood the nature of parliamentary privilege. Uh, in Harry Evans' view, uh, Green denigrates the sincerity with which Menzies, in particular, but also his parliamentary colleagues, genuinely believed that the sanctity of Parliament was under attack. And there was no, in, in Harry Evans' view, no ulterior motives. This was a clear-cut case of contempt of Parliament. And as he says, the uh, Privileges Committee and the House both got it right. Fitzpatrick and Brown therefore got what they deserved. So the question then is who is right? Harry Evans or Frank Green? And they are basically the parameters of the debate. Well, notwithstanding the veracity of, of many aspects of Harry Evans' argument, I mean, it is an argument that's crafted with great skill, it is still difficult to discount the possibility that revenge played a role, uh, to some extent anyway, in the proceedings. But by the same token, Frank Green's version of events seems quite unlikely. It seems improbable, I would have thought, that one article alone would have driven Prime Minister Menzies uh, to embark upon this course of action. He was a much thicker skinned man than that. But more likely, uh, it was about the long term animosity that existed between Frank Brown and Menzies, which actually had nothing much to do with that particular article, but which went right back to the early days of the establishment of the Liberal Party in the 1940s, whereby basically Frank Brown, an appalling idea that such a ratbag could have become a uh, leader of the Liberal Party and probably even more unlikely than anything else, but uh, there, there was, he was certainly had aspirations to be a big figure on the national stage, did Frank Brown. And it's that long-term an animosity, I think, which needs to be taken into account. Moreover, the view that there is an element of revenge here uh, is shaped by one very easily accessible uh, body of primary evidence. And that's namely the 40-odd pages of Hansard, which report the debate. They de report what various honourable members said about the debate. Um, and in large part, let me tell you, they make alarming reading. They uh, fail to vindicate uh, Menzies' subsequent recollection that the parliamentary debate had been held in a remarkably uh, high level and that most, most uh, politicians had uh, behaved very honourably. Um, there was basically a bipartisan, unseemly enthusiasm for revenge. It would be interesting to uh, see, to hear the tapes about uh, the uh, privilege case, but the Speaker of the House, A.G. Cameron, saw fit to have them destroyed. So we only have the um, Hansard. And, the, and, and it really is, they're, they're quite alarming debate. They're quite alarming if that's what you wanted. If you wanted to, these, the, these, these documents to reflect a sort of impartial uh, account of, of events, uh, the reality is they don't. Fitzpatrick and Brown were accused, tried and sentenced uh, by their uh, victims in an atmosphere of hatred. As Alan Reid, a journalist, later remembered, you could feel the waves of hate going out from the parliament to Brownie, standing at the bar of the house. And finally, we have to ask the question too, is whether Charlie Morgan was genuinely um, intimidated? Did he feel himself, uh, did he feel that he was being silenced by this article in the Bankstown Observer? I would argue that it's doubtful that he did. Charlie Morgan was a wily local politician. He'd been involved in inter uh, feuding with Ray Fitzpatrick for 11 years. 
and basically the Mr Bigger Bankstown had done his best to end Morgan's career in the 1946 elections when, as I said, as campaign manager for Jack Lang, um, among the things that Fitzy did then was he contrived to, uh, to publish a damaging smear sheet which repeated all of the allegations, this is 1946, repeated all of the allegations which would again be recycled in 1955. So the events of 1955, the article of 1955 had all been aired before and indeed Charlie Morgan did think that that uh, smear sheet had cost him that seat on that occasion. And indeed when Jack Lang got into Parliament, basically what he did apart from attacking Chifley and others, I mean that was Jack Lang, uh, he also spent a great deal of time repeating all of the allegations against Charlie Morgan in, in Parliament. Uh, th three years of allegations. So by 1955, there can't have been any electors in Bankstown who were not apprised of what were essentially very ancient allegations about a generally popular local member. I mean, like all local members, I'm sure he had his local descendants, but he was generally popular. As Ray Fitzpatrick said about the allegations uh, in 1955 in Bankstown, Fitzy had, a, for an uneducated man, he had a really good turn of phrase. He said, the dogs are barking it. The dogs are barking. Everyone knew about these allegations. No one would have been astonished by the Bankstown Observer. So in my view, employing the contempt machinery against Fitzpatrick was in large part a final throw of the dice to deal with a local rival. And when I started to really research the matter, uh, I was astonished to find that Charlie Morgan had been a member of the Privileges Committee himself in 1954. He wasn't at the time, of course, he had to remove himself in 1955. But arguably, he learnt then uh, what the uh, Privileges Committee could do, uh, what powers it may well have. And indeed, he sat in adjudication of a number of cases, including, ironically, um, one case that related to Jack Lang, who didn't uh, get put in the slammer, but may have come quite close. So in conclusion, um, I think Harry Evans takes a little too much of the case at face value and doesn't know or doesn't reflect enough knowledge about the background of events. Of course, uh, Charlie Morgan's freedom of speech, I would argue, was not genuinely being attacked because it was all old knowledge. There was nothing new in any of this. Of course, his freedom of speech was not genuinely being attacked, uh, neither was Parliament's. And Frank Green is also wide of the mark. While there was a strong element of revenge, so he's right about that, I think primarily the privilege case, if there was a revenge component, was mainly about Charlie Morgan getting his own back against Ray Fitzpatrick, not uh, Menzies and Corwell and others. Uh, retaliating against Frank Brown. The um, fault lines between Frank Green's sense of moral outrage and Harry Evans's view that this was a genuine contempt of parliament continued to shape uh, contemporary understandings of the privilege case. This is a slide of 1994 by uh, Ward O'Neill. Uh, it obviously features Menzies lassoing Frank Brown and you'll note the gallows in the background <laughs> and the bar of the House of Representatives. Uh, he gave one of the great speeches. Uh, it's, it's in every great speech of Australia actually. Frank Brown gave an extraordinary speech. Uh, it was his finest hour uh, at the bar of the House and he talked about Magna Carta and how no one in this country would ever feel safe and it really was a fine piece of speech. All uh, of, of oratory, all derided by Menzies, but it really was a quite an ex extraordinary piece of speech. I think, on the other hand, Harry Evans would have approved of the final image that I'm going to show you. Uh, and this was in the old Parliament House in 2006. And basically, uh, it was just a chronological history of Australia, and they weren't very well organised at this stage in old Parliament House. But uh, it is a, a edited version of the flower of democracy speech to the effect, as you can see, the degree to which this House reserves the freedom of its members to speak and to think will be the measure of its service to democracy. And this was the single event on, uh, in this exhibition of 1955. So I think Harry Evans might well have had a bit to do with putting up that, I don't know, uh, that um, 
that image in Parliament House in 2006. It's an avuncular Menzies uh, revisiting his rationale for the um, privilege case. An argument perhaps that uh, in, in many respects these noble sentiments uh, and, and justification for the 10th of June 1955 uh, serve as a reminder that as well as good intentions, the uh, road to hell uh, is paved with noble sentiments. I'll just conclude with a few observations. I think I've got a little more, bit more time. Five minutes, yeah. Um, I was interested to read uh, recently an article by David Walker about Chinese um, uh, celebrations and it uh, is an event to do with the, uh, actually the 120th anniversary of the Sino-Japanese War that um, David Walker was talking about. But he makes the point that in uh, China, 60 years is a very important event in terms of uh, celebrations because it reflects the, the growth of the, ad from, you know, the emergence of an adult, from a baby to an adult, to adulthood. Um, so I guess in the first 60 years, uh, what has happened? Well, 60 years after Fitzpatrick and Brown, it remains a matter of ongoing significance for anyone who cares about civil liberties and free speech. It uh, does bear upon fundamental principles in a democracy, uh, and that includes the role of the executive uh, branch of government. It does include uh, issues to do with the importance of the rule of law, and it does include issues to do with the separation of powers. Essentially, in 1955, Menzies promised to, that, OK, things might have gone a bit pear-shaped here. So he promised to revisit and regularise the principles of uh, parliamentary privilege. But that promise was never delivered upon. And there have been a number of in incidents since that have sort of reflected upon it, but still the issue remains there in the background. In 1987, for instance, the Hawke government made some ground in uh, terms of deciding that there would be room for judicial intervention uh, in cases to decide a uh, offender's fate, uh, if, uh, in offend if an offender's behaviour constituted contempt, but uh, ironically also increased the penalty from three months to six months. So it was kind of a mixed blessing that way. And even if the uh, prospects of an encore performance of Fitzpatrick and Brown seem slim, perhaps as uh, uh, suggested in 1955, uh, in journals uh, like the Bankstown Observer and in Truth, and probably written by Frank Brown, nonetheless, there is some truth that what Australia does need is a Bill of Rights to give some effect to our basic freedoms for the first time. If uh, nothing else, Fitzpatrick and Brown has inspired some excellent turns of phrase. Of the jailings of the Bankstown too, Gavin Souter suggested in his history of the Commonwealth Parliament that it was as if the House had been annoyed by two blowflies and used its mace to swap them, which I think is a very nice turn of phrase. Or as Enid Campbell, who's you know, given to very careful use of language, the Australian expert in the area of parliamentary privilege, as Enid Campbell suggests, the adjudication of parliamentary contempt cases leaves a great deal to be desired, not because, not least because, as happened in relation to Fitzpatrick and Brown, the judges were judges in their own cause. And I'll just leave you with a uh, few images. Oops, I've done the wrong thing. Here, that's what I wanted to do. There, that's just a few articles on the subject that I've written. There isn't that much else. <laughs> Not that I'm the great expert on Fitzpatrick and Brown, it's just that no one else is that much interested in it, which is I always find quite surprising, actually. Uh, to me, the first time I wrote, I wrote the, the um, ADB entry on Ray Fitzpatrick, which is how I got interested in this, and I actually kept on thinking, no, that can't be right. Sent to jail on a vote of Commonwealth Parliament, there has to be something more to it than that. But, you know, I mean, it is quite scandalous, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, for being interested in the subject and for doing all that research over the years and, and bringing to us today some um, fascinating details about the background to the story. Uh, because I think we have been um, you know, influenced by the Frank Green account, 
by, by later um, analyses of the, the story, but you've given it that local history dimension, the human dimension, and um, I, for one, enjoyed it. And not least did it, I enjoy having our dear Harry here with us <laughs> again. <laughs> Uh, now, th there's time for questions or comments, and if you do have one, put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. We'll start with the gentleman. I, I'm sorry, it's the lights are there. Yes, with you. Thank you. Uh, is this on? Yep. Um, can I just clarify something? Did you say that there is a jail built in this current parliament house to house people? And is, if so, that it was built, what, 30 years after this case and people had had plenty of time to digest it. And and could you provide some context for that? Rosemary probably knows more about it than that. I, I will offer jail. to take that one. Um, it's possibly one of the big urban myths about this building, that there was at one stage um, thought that there should be there should be provision for holding cells in this building. You may even find plans with those um, those areas marked, but they were never built, um, never proceeded with. I think they became uh, electrical substations down in the bowels of the building. So it's a great story. Unfortunately, it did not uh, proceed into bricks and mortar. Um, Philia down here. I can shout out. No, you'll be next. <laughs> Could you please tell me? Could you please tell me what the reaction of Santa Maria was to setting up of the neo-Nazi party by Brown? Well, not in any great detail. No, I don't think he would have been. Uh, one of Frank Brown's many gigs was to write an awful lot for uh, Santa Maria and for m move a, a group up publications. I think Frank Brown might have some claim to being one of the most interesting uh, personalities of Australian history, but he was a prolific journalist and he wrote, not only did he write for the groupers, he wrote for the groupers and not under his own name, he just was a wordsmith. Uh, he wrote for the People's Union, an anti-communist group of that period. Uh, he uh, wrote uh, television reviews. He was just a, could never stop writing. but. Uh, he wasn't a great, ultimately a great fan of Santa Maria. I think, you know, he made some denigratory remark about how they had a very short life expectancy and, but he did write for the movement. I don't know what Santa Maria had said apart from that though, no, or thought about that rather than no, but he did work for the groupers. But then again, he worked for most everybody else as well. I think he might have written most newspapers at some stage, you know, so. <laughs> so a microphone coming on your left. Thank you. Um, I would just like to ask you, when Menzi was giving his great oration on, on the photo you showed us, why was he giving it to school children? I don't... I think the... Uh, I don't know what he said to the school children. I think that just got added that bit to the... Uh, it was just a, an exhibition about chronological, you know, 1954, 55, 56, but you come to 1955 and there it was, you know, I was... Since I'm interested in the issue, I'm just blown away thinking that's extraordinary that that is the one thing that is deemed to be appropriate. So I think he was just talking to the school children and whoever did the caption decided that he might have said that. But he said it to Parliament, yeah, in the main, yeah. Uh, right up the back, Philia, in the last row. My understanding is that after the event, most of the parliamentarians said something like, never again. Um, yes, they did, and so did the press. Uh, I don't think that, that it was ever a great determination that it would never happen again from parliamentarians' concern. One of the, the sort of principles that's lying in the background here is the kind of uh, police, you, you was over due gov. Uh, principle. That is to say, it was widely assumed, for instance, that Frank Brown would end up in jail for something that related to his work. So when it became a question of, OK, is it right to send this uh, rat bag to jail, um, there, that sort of tended to discourage a great deal of thought. 
the uh, parliament, some parliamentarians, the, the, I think it's quite an ignominious affair by many parliamentarians, with the exception and one of those articles there is about Alan Fraser. That's not in the book or anywhere written. I mean, the book ended up being much shorter than what I hoped it would be. But uh, Alan Fraser is, is a parliamentarian who actually campaigned extraordinarily on civil liberties ground against this ever happening again and nearly got chucked out of the Labor Party as a result of it. Um, but most parliamentarians simply moved on to other things. One of the things I should point out that, that, that happened on a Friday afternoon, and as the numbers would suggest, uh, you know, I think as a, a third of Parliament were actually there. They'd all gone home. Uh, it, it, it was a day that was added to the parliamentary sitting and most parliamentarians had gone home on the Thursday, as parliamentarians do. So, uh, you know, again, there weren't that many parliamentarians there. There was a suggestion that, that, that uh, I'd say one of the things, one of the reasons it's never happened again is there was an absolutely almighty barrage from the media and journalists who had, of course, a vested interest, but nonetheless, an appropriate vested interest in that they thought, well, uh, where does freedom of expression stand? Where does freedom of the press stand if these people have been sent to jail? And so there was an extraordinary campaign on those grounds. But I think most parliamentarians, apart from Fitzy's mates, um, and Liz Halen was one of them, were probably pretty comfortable with what had happened. Can I add something? To, to that, Andrew, uh, I think today it would be unthinkable um, in, in either house for a penalty of imprisonment to be imposed on someone who was found guilty of contempt. Andrew, you mentioned the 1987 legislation, mm. and I, I want to be a pedant here. It wasn't Hawke government legislation. Oh, okay. oh, <laughs> it was actually introduced by the then president of the Senate, it was a private senator's bill, and it's the it became the, the parliamentary. Period, yeah. It was in the whole government period. Mm. Yes, yes, I'll give you that. <laughs> but um, it was a parliamentary initiative, and uh, it became the Parliamentary Privileges Act, 1987. And it, that act did a, a number of things, but it it did have a direct link back to the Fitzpatrick and Brown case because when the High Court reviewed the matter, when Brown and Fitzpatrick applied for writs of habeas corpus, the High Court um, heard the matter and, and decided that you know, they respected the law of parliamentary privilege and the right of a House of Parliament to um, run its own affairs and protect its own patch as contempt of court protects the patch of the courts. Mm. And the High Court said that we, you know, we won't look behind the warrant of the Speaker committing these men to, to uh, prison. And the warrant of the speaker simply said that they had been found guilty of, of contempt and were committed. So what the 1987 Act did was to say that um, where a, a presiding officer issues a warrant to commit people to prison for contempt, the warrant will specify what the contempt was. And that will then allow the courts to come in and review that, whereas the, the, the courts didn't really have any any say in this matter because it was such such a, a, entirely a parliamentary question of, of protecting its own own powers and immunities so that was a little little footnote but I, I think such a, a, a penalty today would be unthinkable Uh, what happened to Fitzpatrick after he left prison and did he remain a force in Bankstown and for how long? That's a good question. Um, he didn't live that long. Uh, he was a heavy drinker already and jail did not help that. Indeed, interestingly, you could apparently get a bottle of uh, whiskey a day in the Canberra police station lockup, no problem at all, but uh, so he drank that. So he was never going to live to a ripe old age. Uh, I think it's 60, 60 dies, I'm not sure. But uh, he, I think, actually transformed himself to a degree, as far as I can gather. He, he uh, made a huge amount of money out of property investment. And uh, still to the present day, the, uh, there's money to be made in property investment that's partly to do with the Ray Fitzpatrick's sort of legacy. Um, but uh, he, I think, became more straight than not. And indeed, his problem in the future was trying to get Bankstown Council, for instance, to do have any dealings with him. 
uh, rather than actually being partial towards him. They would either see the words Ray Fitzpatrick and uh, assume it would be a bad idea to have a business relationship with Ray. Uh, but he then went on and made squillions out of being out of a legitimate business. He built a very lucrative uh, farm and, uh, and, as I said, property empire. He kept going what he was doing. He, he probably made more money out of straight, real, well, I'd take to be straight business than he did out of being a shonk. Tim, down the front? Oh, no, but up the back first and then we'll come down the front. Yeah, it's just a follow-up. What happened to Brown afterwards? Ah, uh, well, sorry, I can't see you. Um, well, he uh, started Australia's first neo-Nazi party and that didn't go down very well. He had a few supporters. Uh, he did had a very colourful career afterwards. He, for instance, uh, uh, well, oh, a couple of things. He, the colourful bit is that he, one of the colourful bits is he, he goes off to fight in Rhodesia uh, for a white minority rule there in 1977. He's, a, he's a 62. We think that's my age and I wouldn't care to be off... Uh, fighting, doing anything in Rhodesia at that age. He came back and was associated in the late 1970s with various uh, neo-Nazi uh, right-wing groups, nationalist groups in Sydney, who were very pleased to get him because he was a major figure, a major figurehead for the right. But he also had this sort of strange other life whereby he could run a perfectly legitimate business as both a uh, uh, journalist, and he continued to run Things I Hear, which Sir John Gordon later called Things I Smear, but uh, you know, it, it was a pretty good journal of record and he could also conduct business deals. And then again, as I said, he had this other strange career as a, as a nutter, uh, a real right-wing rat bag. And I only really got interested in him because I'm interested in right-wing rat bags, but um, <laughs> he, yeah, he's, he then dies in various, in, if you want some sense of Schadenfreude, he uh, dies totally alone in a squalid little flat in... Um, King's Cross having drunk himself to death. Mm. So that was the end of him. Yeah. Here. Is a portion of our perception of this, these events formed by contemporary journalists being outraged by another contemporary journalist being victimised? I'd say so, yes. <laughs> uh, when you read the newspapers of the time, uh, I think it's one of the few issues where Tribune, the far left of politics, agreed with the far right or the conservative end of politics, with the Herald and the Argus and the Age and whatever. I mean, there can't have been more universal opposition to this. I think the only person who thought that it was a good idea was Francis James. Um, the, the rest of the, the press was, was very strongly against the whole issue. Mm, it's, is, it a, on, is it an enduring impression it probably is it certainly they're all preserved in national archives too of course so you don't even have to do anything terribly adventurous like read the series of the of the of the newspapers it was a, a major mobilization against that act and probably did was another reason why it's never happened again and you know there are things that i don't know about you and but in terms of imputing violence when uh alan jones that incident of, of talking uh, 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 about uh, Julia and the uh, the chaff bag and throw her into the sea. I thought that was quite contempt, if you like. I mean, that's contempt, but is it a contempt of parliament? Probably not. Journalists, however, say whatever they want. As um, uh, Alan Fraser pointed out, if the same rule had applied, every journalist in the country had defamed the Chifley government. So how come they didn't end up in, uh, uh, in jail? Another thing I'd say too about it is it's also about power and influence because it is significant that it was not a, a Fairfax or a Murdoch, as it were, uh, that, or a Packer that was put in jail, but it was the editor of the Bankstown Observer. That is, this is a relatively small, inconsequential villain uh, who is the editor of a relatively small and inconsequential newspaper. And I think that's another dimension to this. Arguably, it wouldn't have happened if it had been Sir Warwick Fairfax, who would, uh, I don't think he would have done time in jail. He would have had you know, plenty of clever lawyers anyway to have got him out of it. But it is about that dimension as well, I think, yeah. Interestingly, the 1987 Act abolished the contempt of defamation. 
So in a nice prefiguring of the discovery in the Constitution of implied guarantee of freedom of political communication, the Parliamentary Privileges Act abolished that kind of conduct as, you know, as a contempt. So there were no longer any of these contempt cases involving a naughty journalist saying something horrid about a member of parliament. Mm. Unless there are any other quick questions, I think our, our time has come to an end, san sadly, but uh, Andrew, that was a fantastically Thank interesting you. lecture on, on, a, on a, a, a semi-forgotten topic. Uh, and I, I love the idea that, that 60 is an anniversary worth, uh, worth looking at and, and being very serious about. And uh, I'd like you all to thank me, joining, join with me in thanking Dr Andrew Moore for a terrific lecture today. Thank you. And you know where our bookshop is. <laughs> but leave a copy for me.